David Cullen Bain, the Dunedin man found guilty of murdering his family, appeared to go into a state of shock on hearing the guilty verdict. He started saying black hands, that they were taking them away. Black hands. Do you find the accused guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. <laughs> I want to assure you, I did not kill my family. Shootings like the Bain killings don't happen out of the blue. There's always a background, always a leader, possibly a spark. In the last episode, we examined the Bain family and their situation up to the beginning of 1994. In 1988, they returned to New Zealand after a 14-year stint in Papua New Guinea. So let's look at the six months or so before the shootings. I'm journalist Martin Van Bainen, and this is the third episode of a podcast series on New Zealand's most notorious murder case, which started on June the 20th, 1994, when five members of the Bain family were shot in their home in Dunedin. Only the eldest child, David, then 22, survived. Initially, the gunman appeared to be David's father, Robin, but within a week, David was arrested. He was convicted of the murders in 1995, but acquitted after a second trial in 2009 and now lives in Christchurch with his wife and child. 1994 started well for Robin, who had his Christmas and New Year break away from the tensions on every street by going to Otaki to join his younger brothers painting their mother's house. On their working holiday, Robin's brother Michael found Robin his usual gentle self and still enthusiastic about his teaching job. He told David's second trial... Robin um, was um, about six years older than I was, <clears throat> but um, he was a good brother in terms of being helpful, uh, and um, uh, he was, I always considered him to be wise and gentle and considerate. Uh, he was full of humour. Um, his conversation was always honourable, always steady, always encouraging. I never actually saw him lose his temper. He was always steady and and uh, responsible as a person. At this time, you saw him at the Christmas of '93 over the three weeks then, and your when he came to stay with you before you finally went back to um, Dunedin. Did you find him any different to the Robin you've just been describing to us? Actually, no. The year also looked promising for David. He enrolled in a part-time course at the University of Otago, opting for classics and music papers. This allowed him to stay on the dole, and while he studied, he could still help his mother in the garden and work on their plan for the new house at the Every Street property. David was still having singing lessons and had sung in a production of the play Tempest for Dunedin's Summer Shakespeare program. During the production, he became friendly with a young woman who was studying ecology at Otago University. David was in the choir and Harriet, not her real name, was in the orchestra. After two years at home, things seemed to be looking up for David. However, Leanne Dick, who was in the same class as David's younger sister Laniet at high school, recalls a strange meeting early in 1994 which suggests otherwise. In an affidavit in 2010, Dick said she met Arawa at a movie theatre early in 1994. An excerpt from the affidavit is read by an actor. Arawa insisted that I come home with her because she told me she didn't want to be alone in the car with David. I had to cancel my own ride home in order to meet her request. I asked why she needed me and she said that David is controlling and manipulative. She said she hadn't been out with her friends for months because David always tagged along and made sure that he drove the car and went out as well. She didn't want him to go out with her, so it got to the point that she chose not to go out anymore. In the affidavit, Leanne said Laniette had told her Margaret and David were in a strange sect and wanted to get rid of Robin. Laniette thought her father a beautiful person and was angry he was being isolated from the family, Dick said. From 1993 to the time of her death, Laniette was renting a room in a boarding house in Russell Street in central Dunedin. She was working as a freelance escort and using a cell phone owned by an acquaintance called Dean Cottle, whom we heard about in the last episode. 
it was fairly obvious to others how she was making a living, as a fellow Russell Street resident told David's second trial. It was fairly easy to figure out that, that she was doing um, some sort of escort type job. She um, spoke to me one night when I got home from work. Um, she was a wee bit upset. Um, she ex- was a wee bit concerned that I was a, you know, a wee bit different from the other people in the place and that um, with her coming and going and um, just what I thought of it and I told her that I pretty much knew what she was doing and it, it wasn't really something that worried me, it had nothing to do with me. Um, yeah. I think it was roughly a month, two, two weeks to a month sort of in, in that period um, before the death. She explained to me what she was doing. Um, she was very um, upset about it to a certain extent. Um, there's a guy that she was working at a pimp. Um, he was threatening to um, expose her to her parents because um, she was trying to get away from doing that type of work. Um, so she was quite upset about it. It wasn't a very good family life from what she was talking. Um, she was very um, fearful. Um, of going anywhere near the house or anywhere near her father. She said he was doing things that weren't appropriate. Um, it wasn't until very later on, this conversation went for quite some time, went to the early hours of the morning. Um, she mentioned that um, he was touching her in, in ways that he shouldn't have been. Um, she didn't come out exactly and say at the start that there was any incest or anything happening, but it was fairly easy to, to pick out what she was talking about. And if I may just ask you, that there was no relationship at all between you and Lanny yet? No, no, there wasn't, no. no. There was an offer um, made <laughs> earlier in the morning um, that she said, and, and there would be no charge. Um, and I, <laughs> yeah, it's, it wasn't the right thing to do. Um, I've, yeah. I, I felt sorry for her and, and not really wanting to add to her to her problem, so to speak. So there was Lani at talking about incest to someone she just met. Despite her apparent fears, she was soon to join her father to live at Tyree Beach with him. The cell phone Lani at had been using was disconnected on March the seventh, nineteen ninety four, and her financial position became more secure a few weeks later, when she turned eighteen, and became eligible for the unemployment benefit. Around this time, she was probably doing less sex work, but was still a heavy cannabis user. It's possible Robin was keen to get Laniette to Tyree to keep her away from bad influences back in town, but Laniette retained her room at her flat in Russell Street, keeping a foot in both camps. On May the 27th, Laniette called in to see David at the university, but found only his friend Sean Clark, who ended up a doctor in the British Army. He reported Laniette being upset and agitated and saying she wanted David to talk to Margaret to see if she could come back home. She couldn't stand what he was doing to her anymore, she said. Clark assumed she meant Robin because they had been talking about him, but she could equally have been talking about her pimp. So what was happening with Robin? As the year went on, other principals in the South Otago area felt concerned Robin was deteriorating mentally and physically. He seemed frustrated at not getting interviews for other jobs and disheartened about teaching. The principal of a nearby school, Mellon Stone, had this to say to David's second trial. In his early days, he was motivated, interesting, fun to be with, had a great sense of humour, and uh, it was just just great to be around. But I was fascinated by the the things that he knew. Uh, In 94, he was just quiet, um, he, he seemed to be involved with his own thoughts. He wasn't motivated. Uh, just he, he seemed to have lost a lot of interest in in uh, in the schooling and, and life uh, as a, as a principal. I think he was very discouraged by the fact that he couldn't uh, progress any further. Uh, in his career, or didn't seem to be able to progress any further in his career. I know he had applied for several jobs to get out of um, Tyree Beach, but it it hadn't eventuated. But Robin's fellow teachers at his school saw none of this. For instance, Darlene Thompson, 
who worked with Robin every day, says he was just as committed as always, and she didn't see any signs of a shortened fuse. And what about Arawa, who, as we heard earlier, had told Laniette's friend Leanne Dick that David seemed to be keeping tight tabs on her? Arawa's year was busy from the start. She was in her second year at Teachers College and also doing university papers. She had an income from working in the museum cafe and also from babysitting. She worked hard and was well liked and respected. We have already mentioned her friend Kirsten Kosh. They had been close during their time at Bayfield High School, although the friendship had fallen away in their last year of school when Arawa was head girl. In 1994, they rekindled their friendship, with Arawa staying at Kirsten's flat on one occasion and Kosh visiting every street. In a statement to the police in 2007, which is now read by an actor, Kosh said, She said there were things that she couldn't tell anybody about. She made reference to a family secret, but other than that, she offered no details. At one stage, we went outside so I could have a cigarette. Arawa seemed very upset and shocked and continually turned round to check if any of the family were around and listening. I got the impression she wanted to tell me what was wrong, but wouldn't because she was scared she would be overheard by her family. Kosh goes on to say that on another visit to every street, Ara was going to get her some beads from the front room and apparently had to get a key from David's room first. Arawa snuck into the front room to get the beads for me. I didn't want to stay too long after Arawa had told me that David didn't want people in there. I was scared because Ara had said that David had a gun. She told me that he had it to shoot rabbits at Tari, but she also said that it made the family feel scared. She said David having a gun in the house made her feel scared. After David's second trial, Kosh told me that Arawa had actually told her David was threatening the family with the rifle and also that he controlled the family's use of the lounge. However, she added that Arawa was inclined to exaggeration and after Arawa mentioned David's threatening behaviour, she had tried to make light of it. So the family had its worries about David, who was starting to get closer to his new friend from the Tempest. During those first six months of 1994, the friendship between David and Harriet was developing, and they saw more of each other as they started rehearsing for another musical called The Gondoliers. David had told Harriet about the plans for the new house and how pleased he was to be working on the project. At David's second trial, she said, Yes, I asked him where he lived, and he said that he lived in Anderson's Bay in an old house that was starting to fall down, so they were they had plans to build a new one. Um, and he was sort of quite involved with that, and he was going to be helping to build the new house. He talked about there would be a workshop, and um, there would be two large bedrooms joined by a bathroom, and he said one of the bedrooms would be f- for me, and I sort of joked and said, oh, it's the other bedroom for your mum and dad, and he said, dad's got nothing to do with it. What sort of manner did he say that when he said dad's got nothing to do with it? He was quite serious, and I realised that it was not something that I should pursue. Right. So do I take it you didn't pursue that? No, I didn't. <laughs> the house dream was obviously important to David, and clearly he did not want his father involved. But what about Margaret's state of mind at the time? She caught up with an old acquaintance a few weeks before the shootings and didn't seem at all well. This is Cyril Wilden, an educational psychologist who had known Margaret and Robin for a long time. So she knew that I had some interest in that area and when she came in, she uh, immediately told me that she had given uh, away um, belief in um, God and and churches and so on and that she had found a, a better way what she told me uh, really was what I regarded as new age ideas uh, about um, let me think that you couldn't rely on God because there was no God so you had to find other means and a, 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 there was a, a divinity type uh, process that she demonstrated to me with a little pendulum of it I'm not quite sure whether it was string or cotton, whatever, but she had this string and the pendulum, and, and she brought that out. She, she, she demonstrated to some extent about how that could guide her in making decisions. 
My impression was that Margaret was a, a very strong willed person. She she just poured out her her story to me and I just listened almost dumbfounded, shall we say. It was uh, I'd hard to get a word in edgeways. Uh, and I just felt that she was not in a, in a really a rational state of mind to be able to discuss uh, any issue from my point of view. So it was a case of listening to what she was saying. It was the first time I got any inclination that Robin would have been under maybe considerable emotional stress and pressure in, in his home environment. And I was very concerned about that then. Despite his strained home situation, Robin still seemed to be looking forward to things. Fellow Royal Dunedin male choir member, William Christie, often had a chat with Robin during coffee breaks and got to know him quite well as he told David's second trial. He was a quiet person, inclined to be fairly serious, earnest and uh, full of goodwill, either on the Monday immediately prior to his death or perhaps the Monday before that, Robin suggested to me that uh, as he and I were the only uh, two men in the choir who had sons also in the choir, we could work up a quartet and uh, that would be uh, provide uh, an item that we could perform he was positive about the future and uh, uh, our parting words were that he would look out some music for us to work up. He was positive and uh, his intention was to, that we would develop it and work it up. He didn't display any form symptoms of depression at that time. His mental state has since been questioned and I felt that I had uh, a contribution to show that as recently as two weeks before his death, he, sh- he didn't display any form of uh, depression. In your time as being a nurse over that 40 year period, uh, have you seen people progress into depression? Yes, I have. Uh, not rapidly. Um, depression is a, a, a mental condition which uh, tends to gradually overwhelm people. We are now entering a period when the killings are only weeks away and some things seem to be bothering David. Only six days before the murders, David organised a meeting with a young woman he knew through his music studies and who was also a friend of Harriet's. We know that David, like his mother, had a habit of talking for long periods and the young woman was to see David in full flight as she told David's second trial. This part of the conversation was, was, was very in-depth about how he felt that he didn't have any real friends, um, that he had a private face and a public face. And the public face was the smiley, jokey one that everybody knew, and that the private face was the serious one. Um, and he wasn't sure whether um, it was somebody that he could really trust. Um, he wasn't sure whether it was a relationship he really he wanted to pursue. He knew that he didn't want, you know, it wasn't um, like she wasn't the one. He wasn't something that he was going to end up in marriage, for example. Um, that um, whether it was worth him investing the time and effort into it. Um, he'd been in the position where he'd been badly hurt. Um, He'd had a previous girlfriend um, that had been very intense and he'd ended it because it was just too much pressure. Did he say anything about um, why he was wary about what might happen to him? Yeah, uh, he... um, The sort of culmination of all, you know, the the friend in Papua New Guinea, the two friends at Opera Live, um, and um, the previous girlfriend was that he said that anybody I've ever loved... I've ended up hurting. We talked a bit more about um, Papua New Guinea and in particular, you know, I'd asked whether or not he could talk about who he talked about with that to and he said he talked to his... His mum was the only one that he could talk to about Papua New Guinea and... um, But he found it very hard talking to her um, 
for two reasons. One was that he found it really hard to express, and the second was that she talked too much for him to be able to um, really tell her what he wanted to say. So that's when we started talking about his dad. And he said that um, the family didn't want Robin around. And I asked, I said, well, you know, if your mum doesn't want your dad around, why doesn't she take out a restraining order on him um, so that he wasn't living at the property and wasn't around the family? And he said that um, it was up to Robin to recognise that he wasn't wanted and um, that um, if they separated formally and all that, if they got divorced, they'd have to sell the house. And if they sold the house, it would mean that the building programme, the, the project that they had, the, the building of the sanctuary, wouldn't happen. And it would mean that Margaret and Stephen would get a flat in town together. Um, that... Uh, Arawa would go flatting and he'd have to go flatting as well and um, the house would, you know, the sanctuary would never be built it was going to be some kind of um, like a peace centre or meditation centre it was going to be massive it's going to have about seven bedrooms so that there was enough room for all the family to be there but there was also going to be room for other people to come and stay and sort of be closed off from the outside world and um, David had worked very hard or he he you know, thought this was very important too, and um, he'd been working in the garden. And the night when I'd gone round before, he, when I'd gone outside, he said, "Oh, this is where this is going to be, and where that's going to be." Um, and he then went on to say that this is one of the one of the examples where he was really frustrated and irritated with his dad because his dad had, you know, where he'd been working in the garden, his dad had come home with a trailer load of soil and dumped it all over everywhere he'd been working. And he'd worked quite hard because he'd got calluses on his hands from the tools. The reason that Laniette had gone flatting when she did was because she was the one that stuck up for Robin. Um, he said that she was the one that was for Robin um, and because of that it made it quite difficult for her to be at home. And what did you say about the divisions in the family? That, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, basically, from what I understood, Margaret and Aroa and David and Stephen didn't want Robin around, and um, Laniette, um, she couldn't, she, 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 she was very supportive of Robin, which is why she didn't stay right. at home. Did you say? Anything else to you before he left you could remember in particular? Yeah. Um, he'd been in my flat for about three hours and I knew I had somebody else turning up shortly after two. And um, I had to say, look, I'm, you know, sorry, this person's coming. And um, I think we got as far as standing up and we were still in the dining room. And he said that he thought that um, something horrible was going to happen. Did and you say when? I mean, no, time frame. no, um, he didn't. And I said, I asked him what he meant, and was it anything to do with? He said, I don't know. And at that point, the knock on the door came, and there was no opportunity to explore that further. What are we to make of this? If David was planning something, the long heart to heart with the friend was a strange thing to do unless it was, perhaps, a cry for help. His apparent premonition of something horrible happening would, of course, prove to be eerily correct. And so we get to the Friday before the killings. Laniette went to an interview with cleaning company owner Jeff Murphy for a job as a telemarketer and was offered the position almost straight away. She was due to start on Monday, and to Murphy she seemed happy and excited. According to his statements, David came home from university on Friday to see Robin sitting in the living room with Margaret, Stephen and Arawa. Everything was the same as usual, he would later say. He could feel the usual tension between his parents. That night, he and Harriet went to a Thai restaurant and he started talking about relationships. 
Yeah, we talked on the phone on Wednesday or Thursday that week. Um, it was quite a long phone conversation. <laughs> um, I'd sort of been preparing for exams and things, and um, he told me that he had fallen over in his music teacher's garden and broken his glasses. And we had quite a lengthy conversation about contact lenses, because I wear contact lenses. And um, I asked him if he had a spare pair of glasses, and he said he had an old pair, but he didn't wear them. The following day, did you see him again? On the Friday, yes, I did. I had... Um, I had an exam in the morning and then in the afternoon I was in town. When I came home, there was a note waiting for me that he had written saying that he was going to pop brown later to take me out to mellow out. And um, so he came around about six and we were, he wanted to go to, up to Moana Pool for a sauna, but I didn't want to do that. So we had a, we went down George Street instead and had a Thai meal. We talked about relationships. He said that he didn't really want to talk about the relationship between him and me, but we talked about relationships with our parents. I talked about my relationship with my father. Um, I said that I hadn't been a planned child, and he said that Stephen hadn't been planned. He said that his father wanted Stephen, but his mother didn't. He said that he didn't have a great relationship with his father, that he didn't really see him as a father figure, and that there was someone in Papua New Guinea who he had seen as a father figure. On the same Friday, Dean Cottle, whose phone Laniet had been using for his sex work, bumped into Laniet on the main street in Dunedin. In a statement to the police soon after the shootings, and parts of which are now read by an actor, Cottle, then 27, explained the background and talked about the meeting. I first met Laniette about 10 months ago in a bar in Dunedin. We got talking and got on well. After that meeting, we got to know each other and became friends. She was a nice girl, and we got on well. About the family, she told me that her father had been having sex with her, and this had been happening for years, but he was still doing this, as I believed it. She told me that she wouldn't go to bed until 3am. She didn't want it coming out what had happened to her. I wasn't to tell anyone was one of the reasons for her leaving home. She was also fed up with everything. Her mother was hassling her, and they used to sit around and each take turns at talking to God. I decided on Friday, 17 June, to give her a ring and see what she was up to. Later that day, I was driving through town, and I saw Laniette coming out of a coffee shop. It was in the afternoon. I stopped and spoke to her on the footpath for about five to ten minutes. She told me that she was going to make a new start of everything and that her parents had been questioning her about what she was doing. She said that she was going to tell them everything and make a clean start of things. She'd always been very, very scared of her parents finding out what she was doing. I thought by saying that, she was going to tell her parents about prostitution. That was about all we said. I don't think it would have taken longer than five minutes. You will notice that Cottle said nothing about the phone Laniette was using or the allegations he was connected with her prostitution. In a statement in 1995, after David's first trial, he added that Laniette was clearly upset when he spoke to her on the Friday, and she did not refer to the alleged incest with her father. David's father, Robin, spent the Friday at school and spoke with Ingrid Dunkley, a manager at the Ministry of Education who worked with young people with special needs. Robin rang her to discuss the children he required funding for. She says it was a very normal pleasant conversation. Robin hadn't collated all the information, so he was going to bring it to her office on Monday morning. She didn't know what time. Robin also appears to have made a few phone calls in the week before his death to get some relief cover for himself or his fellow teacher. The defence would seize on those calls to suggest Robin was not planning on being at school the following week. Margaret was at home on the Friday before the shootings, and Geoffrey Swift called in to drop off a video taken of a recent production in which David had performed. He knew David well through the Dunedin Opera Company, where Swift did a lot of backstage work. Swift told David's second trial, 
He was a, a cheeky, hard case. A lot of practical joking and things that ha- happens with young people, and he was um, often at the centre of that. David was quite frequently um, the one who had the jokes played on him, and he always took it in good vein with a lot of laughter. David was just off the university when Swift arrived. He borrowed $10 from Margaret for the video, sort of hugged her, and took off on his bike. Swift spent about 90 minutes chatting with Margaret. She said that basically David had taken over being head of the house while, David, while uh, Robin was uh, working down at Tyre Mouth at the school and that uh, David had taken over the day-to-day um, father things that, that uh, the male of the household does. She seemed to be very appreciative of that. Margaret made mention that this was the first time that the family this weekend was going to be the first time the whole family were together, that um, uh, Robin was coming up from the school and Laniette would be home that weekend as well. In fact, she uh, told me that the room that we were in looking at these drawings was in fact Laniette's room. About 5.30 on Friday afternoon, Arva met her friend Tim Smith at the university. He was an 18-year-old law student and they decided to have a meal together at the student union. They had met through theatre sports in 1993 and become good friends. Arawa talked about her family, although she didn't mention David or Laniette. An actor reads from his statement. The fact she told me that she wanted to move out told me that things must be getting bad, as she wasn't one of those characters who get wound up. The general overall thing was there was a lot of fighting and tension in the family. She was siding with her mother because her father was never there but her mother had been taking her anger out on her. She told me she was siding with her mother because of what her father had done. They talked about flatting, and Arawa seemed keen to join the flat Smith was planning for the following year. She started talking about it. At one stage, she had to stop herself and say, I'm not in yet. She also talked about cleaning and whether we were any good at it. I told her we were. They parted company about 6.45, and Arawa went off to the library. After the dinner with Harriet... David still had one more appointment on the Friday evening. Earlier in the year, when he had sung in The Tempest, David had got to know its director, Wallace Chapman, now a well-known broadcaster. Chapman had wanted David to sing on a CD recording on the Friday before the shootings. They had a number of phone calls to finalise details, as Chapman told David's second trial. Talking about just taking up the time and... And, and, and food and stuff. And this is in the, in the weeks leading up to, the, uh, up to the recording of it on the 17th of June? Yes, it is. And are there any particular phone calls that you recall uh, with David Bain uh, prior to the recording taking place? One the night before, which was a long conversation, a substantial conversation. This is the Thursday evening? The Thursday evening. And what was discussed on that phone conversation? Um, just about the future really how um, I was going to the gym and uh, he wanted to get, you know, start getting to triathlons and that type of thing I suggested why don't you come along uh, about the life, about, um, about his girlfriend how things were, things were going well um, yeah, he was very upbeat Was he any different on that phone conversation than he had been previously? No, not really. So let's just quickly recap what we know about the Bain family as we approach the weekend before the killings. We know Robin had made an arrangement for the Monday and seemed to be carrying on much as usual. Laniette appeared to be heading for some sort of disclosure to her family over the weekend and was living with the father who, according to what she had told strangers, had or was still molesting her. Arawa was working hard and thinking about leaving her strife-torn home to go flatting. David had an exam coming up and had unloaded his problems on a friend who suggested he get counselling. Margaret was looking forward to having the family together in the weekend. In any event, after the Friday came the Bain family's very last weekend and it was a busy one. A neighbour, Wayne Marsh, had complained about the lack of spouting on one side of the Bain house. The runoff was eroding a bank at the back of his garage, and the council had intervened when nothing was done. On the Saturday before the murders, Marsh noticed ladders up against the house, and Robin, David and Stephen apparently working together 
but, as he said, not much communication appeared to be going on. On Sunday, Robin drove David and Stephen to St Kilda Beach, where they took part in the annual polar plunge. Robin looked after their gear as they joined the throng in the icy water. Later that day, he went to a seminar on genealogy. After the polar plunge, David went to choir practice. He was rehearsing a play called Oedipus Rex, a Greek tragedy about a man who kills his father and sleeps with his mother. The Baines were apparently going to have a family meal together on Sunday night, although Margaret doesn't appear to have gone to a lot of trouble. Apparently she had some fish in the microwave and David and Larniette went off to get some chips from the nearby takeaway bar. David says he went to bed somewhere around 8.30pm. He and his family watched a nature video that David's girlfriend had lent him until Margaret and Robin decided to watch a thriller on television. David doesn't mention any upset over switching programs, but in interviews just after the shootings, he told police he and Robin had had a row over the chainsaw before he went to bed. In fact, the row was one of the first things he told police about after the shootings, as this part of his statement, read by an actor, shows. He and I had had constant, not battles, pushing and pulling over the chainsaw. He was always taking it down there and I need it for the work to do. Last night, I said I wanted the chainsaw. I said it quite firmly. He tried to beat me down. He was asserting his authority or his right to rule the roost. It's always been like that. David doesn't mention that not long before, he had had an accident with the chainsaw, cutting his leg badly. David says he woke up at some stage after he went to bed to hear a car drive off. This had to be either Robin or Margaret heading off to the nearest ATM machine about 11.30 to pay off their credit card before it started to incur interest. Just bear in mind that he would be adding to that account. Heading off at that late hour to pay the credit card was typical of the Bain's frugal behaviour. David supporters say the trip to the ATM was probably made after Larniette had disclosed about the incest and a shocked Margaret wanted to get some cash out to face the next day. But she didn't clear out the account and if she was shocked, she still remembered to pay the credit card. By early next morning, five members of the Bain family were dead. Essentially, they had been executed. New Zealand's most talked about murder case was beginning. In the next episode, we'll look mainly at the week after the shootings, particularly at David's behaviour as others perceived it. I'm Martin Van Bainen. Thank you for listening. This podcast is a joint stuff and tandem studios production. Written and presented by Martin Van Bainen, audio engineered and co-produced by Brett Robertson, and produced by Dave Dunlay and Kamala Heyman.